This is Special Prosecutor Larry Clayman. I'm the only lawyer ever to obtain a court ruling that a president of the United States committed a crime. For truth. For competition. As a young lawyer, I helped break up AT&T. That's why you have all your cell phones today. For sovereignty. For the republic. I'm the guy who, at Judicial Watch, which I founded, uncovered the Chinagate scandal. Millions of dollars going to the Clinton campaign, corrupting our political system. For the privacy of citizens. And I'm the only guy to have enjoined the National Security Agency from mass surveillance on hundreds of millions of Americans. Tearing it up. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. Bringing it back. We're going to take this country apart and put it back together again in the way envisioned by our founding fathers. It's not just talk. We're not just regurgitating news stories. Larry Clayman, special prosecutor, is making the news. And now, here's Larry. Welcome to this week's edition of Special Prosecutor with Larry Clayman. Uh, we have a great show. A lot of things have happened in the last week. They always do in our cases as well as in other aspects of life. And I want to talk first about Attorney General Jeff Sessions, because he's obviously a topic of discussion these days. Uh, he had some difficulty with the president this week. Uh, the president said that he wouldn't have appointed him if he knew that he was going to appoint a special counsel. That would be Robert Mueller. Uh, that's an interesting statement. Uh, Sessions, in, ex in response, says, I'm staying. I'm not leaving. He didn't resign. Obviously, on its face, it appears to undercut the authority of the Attorney General of the United States. But on the other hand, it may have been Tweedledee Tweedledum. Perhaps Trump and Sessions worked this out because it creates some distance between them, which maybe will get the vicious left swing media and the Democrats off the back of Attorney General Sessions. You know, I like Sessions. I told you that I did. I've met him as a young lawyer uh, in Mobile, Alabama, when he was U.S. Attorney. I met him since at various events. He's a gentleman. Uh, he's from the South. I went to Duke and Emory. I kind of consider myself a quasi-Southerner, even though I was born in Philadelphia. Well, my dad comes from South Philadelphia, so maybe that counts. Uh, by the way, it was my birthday yesterday. It was my dad's birthday as well, so I'm honoring him today. He was a great man, a meat packer, as we said. I learned how to slice and dice. But with regard to Sessions, Here's the problem that he has right now. He basically has been neutered in many ways. I mean, he's he's pursuing some of his projects on immigration, on marijuana enforcement, which I think maybe he wants – he should really use his resources somewhere else right now. I mean, it's important, but there's so many things that are out there. Uh, law enforcement, uh, backing up police officers, that's certainly good. But I approached him, as I've said before – over the last year with regard to Cliven Bundy and the Bundy trial. And that's a very, very important case, as I've said. Go to clivenbundydefensefund.org to contribute and also to see what we're doing. It's important because Cliven claimed he didn't owe any money to the federal government for grazing fees. He claims that the land is owned by Nevada. I believe he's correct. It's a peculiarity in the way land was transferred over the last decades, much too complicated to discuss on this on this radio show, but you can read about it at clivenbundydefensefund.org. Anyway, he decided to pay the money to Nevada, and they wouldn't cash the check. And over the years, you had the corrupt Senator Harry Reid get involved, who wanted to have the land that Cliven ranched uh, for 150 years, starting with his great-grandfather, his last name was Levitt, interestingly enough. And uh, this was a land grab, and it's happened throughout the West, particularly with ranchers. Hundreds of ranchers have lost their ranches, uh, environmental so-called protection. It's actually just a way to drive them off the land. The issue with Cliven was a desert tortoise that was endangered, as alleged by our so-called government. I call it our so-called government because it really isn't our government in many ways. It represents itself, not the people. And, of course, uh, the grazing fees. Cliven went into court himself. Uh, he probably should have had a lawyer at the time. He didn't have me. And he didn't win. And the judge said, well, the land belongs to the United States. It was a federal court, so what do you expect the judge to rule? If he ruled otherwise, his career would probably be over in terms of any higher appointments. And years later, many years later, when Obama was the president, all of a sudden— they wanted 
to take all of his cattle, uh, as the court had said, could be claimed uh, as payment uh, for the grazing fees. Well, Cliven said, no, uh, I protest this. And that's all he did. And his family, that's all they did. But instead, Bama and Reed and others sent in these goons from the Bureau of Land Management to threaten their lives, to drive them off the land, to take their cattle. But in the process, after their lives were threatened, Cliven's sister, Margaret, was beaten and thrown to the ground. His two sons, two of his sons, he has 14 kids, were tased. His dog was violently kicked and harmed, and his cattle, particularly the bulls, were killed. I mean, bulls are used to raise the herd. So without bulls, you don't have a herd. You don't have a livelihood. They did all this stuff. And of course, it made the news. It was on Sean Hannity's show and Fox and on radio all the time. And many other commentators were carrying it because it was such an injustice. And people from around the country came to protest with Cliveland. But they saw that how his family had been mistreated and beaten by the government. So they came armed, which is their right under the Second Amendment. They thought maybe it could happen to them if the same thing occurred uh, and they were beaten up. And of course, in the end, the government stood down and left. And the sheriff of Clark County, that's the county that Cliven's ranch is in in Bunkerville, it's the same county as Las Vegas, Nevada, Harry Reed's hometown with his son, they told the federal government to leave. Now, Cliven made some remarks after that. He said he equated the plight of his family to that of the Negro in the Old South, claiming how the federal government had destroyed black people in the South by taking over their lives and how the same thing happened to him. And Obama took offense at that. And you can see a video at clivenbundydefensefund.org, clivenbundydefensefund.org. And Obama threatened Cliven over that remark. And sure enough, two years later, Cliven was indicted with his sons and 17 other defendants, both in Nevada and the sons were invited, indicted in Oregon and tried. The sons have been acquitted, by the way. They basically represented themselves. The jury just didn't buy that the government could act this way. And I want you to ask yourself this question. How is it, even if you owe the government money, which Cliven claims he does not, how is it that a government can bust into your house, beat up your family, kill your cattle, and just think that they're immune from anything. And you can't even defend yourself with your Second Amendment rights and your First Amendment right to protest that peacefully. This is exactly why we have a Fourth Amendment in our Constitution, because that's what King George III did going back to revolutionary days before we declared independence in Philadelphia on and around July 4th, 1776. This is why we have our Constitution. And Cliven believes in the Constitution. In fact, Cliven's a Mormon. In, in Mormon faith, the Constitution is equal to the Book of Mormon. It was written by God. And he's standing there for your principles because the same thing can happen to you. So with all of this, I went to Jeff Sessions when he became Attorney General. I spoke with him on the phone. I have a cell phone number. I have his home phone number. I didn't want to bother him. But he told me he would have this case reviewed. I didn't tell him how to come out. I told him just it needs to be looked at again because this was a hit job by Obama and his attorney general, Loretta Lynch, who was Obama in a skirt ideologically, and uh, also Harry Reid. And he promised me he would do that. And I tried to set up a meeting. And over the course of time, I tried to get that meeting to be able to explain to the attorney general. I sent him a video of what happened, of how everybody was harmed, except the federal agents were never harmed. No hair on their head was ever harmed. And he hasn't met with me. And we have a petition up at clavenbundydefensefund.org because we need to force him to meet with me. And he said, well, if I do it, I'll have to meet with the prosecutors. I said, fine, meet with the prosecutors. They're all Obama prosecutors. And frankly, you should have them removed, your attorney general, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. Well, he hasn't met with me. And in fact, instead, he went to Las Vegas last week and he met with the prosecutor there and he praised the prosecutor, a guy named Stephen Myrie, M-A-H-R-E. I mean, the guy is a hack and he's a clone of Obama. 
and he's done a lot of prosecutorial misconduct in this case, new, too numerous to, to discuss. And at the same time, though, Sessions said, I'm not taking sides. Now, that's very unusual. Attorney General's not taking sides with his own prosecutor. So he knows something's wrong here. And, but he's playing both sides of the fence. And we need to convince him with this petition that we're going to send to him that Jeff Sessions, you got a man up guy. I mean, I like you, but you've got to be a man here. And you, the buck stops on your desk. And you cannot allow this political prosecution to continue. And I believe that Cliven was prosecuted because he used the word Negro. He thought that was the correct word. Martin Luther King had used that word in describing himself and his race. And it's a huge injustice. And if we don't stand up for Cliven, and have this reviewed and the case hopefully dismissed. We've got this judge who hates Cliven. She's handpicked judge of Harry Reid and Obama. Uh, And Attorney General, he needs to step in here for all Americans, as well as ranchers, as well as Cliven. So go to clivenbundydefensefund.org, contribute to Cliven's defense fund, but also see what this is about, because this is the first time in modern history that anyone stood up to the government using their Second Amendment rights Nobody was harmed, but of course they had the right, the protesters and Cliven, and Cliven wasn't even armed, neither were his sons, to defend themselves. And that's why this is so important, because if Cliven is forced to do life imprisonment in this case, and that's what they're looking for, they want to put him away, they want to make it an example, they want to say no one should ever, ever question what this federal government does. It's all powerful, it is the equivalent to people like Obama, Reid, and this judge is God. That's what the, the left thinks of, of government. They don't need God. They just need government. You know, that's what happened in the Soviet Union and, and now Russia. And we cannot allow this to happen. And that's why we need your support. So go to clivenbundydefensefund.org. In the second segment, I'm going to tell you, I visited with Cliven yesterday in prison. It was my birthday. I spent my birthday in prison the second year in a row. But that's okay because that's how important this case is. We'll be right back. Fearless. He's claiming he's crazy, he's racist, he's out to kill the Democrats. Dangerous. He don't care, he uses the court and the law. Lethal. This is bad. Special prosecutor. Very bad. Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. I want to continue this discussion of the Bundy case because it's so important. I know I've discussed it on previous shows, but the American people need to understand what is at stake, and our supporters need to understand what is at stake. So I visited with Cliven yesterday in the federal prison in Pahrump. It's out about 80 miles outside of Las Vegas. Beautiful ride out there, but once you get to Pahrump, it's desert. I mean, all that's there are rattlesnakes. And interestingly enough, uh, several weeks ago, I was coming out of the prison after I visited Cliven before, and a guard was coming with me. And I said, boy, this place is like Alcatraz for anybody to escape. Obviously, Cliven's been a model prisoner. He's, everybody loves him. He's kind of like a celebrity in there in some ways. But uh, he said to me, he says, well, we're not worried about rattlesnakes, because uh, I said that way it'd be so hard to escape. He says, I see UFOs here every night. <laughs> this is Area 51 where the United States tested a nuclear weapon, an atom bomb in World War II to eventually drop on Hiroshima, and also where there's a secret military base. These may be American drones or something else in a secret military program. But I'll tell you what's not secret at Pahrump, and that's the incarceration of Clive and Bundy. Uh, He's been kept there now for a year and a half. The judge denied him his speedy trial rights. He uh, was denied right of counsel. I'm up at the Supreme Court now trying to get into the case. Uh, We're trying to prepare a defense. But one of the aspects of this is that I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for Cliven for all the documents, which the government must have about the days leading up to the standoff, why Cliven was prosecuted. This is very important for our defense of Cliven. And if you can believe this, uh, the FBI, because I filed it with the FBI, the Justice Department, the Bureau of Land Management, came back and told the court, and, and again, this court... Uh, the judge is a very, very leftist judge by the name of Colleen kohler Catelli. I've had a lot of problems with her in the past. She rubber stamps everything the government wants. She hates Clive and Bundy. She doesn't like me because she was appointed by Clinton. Her husband defended Secret Service agents uh, during the time of the Lewinsky scandal. 
I mean, she she really is very political and partisan. She rules on her politics. Anyway, the FBI comes in and says, well, we we have documents, but it's going to take us 41 years to produce them. 41 years. I'll be 107 years old. I'll be long since dead. The judge is older than that. She'll be dead. Cliven surely will be dead. He's 72. And even the young lawyer at the Justice Department in the U.S. Attorney's Office who's defending the government, so to speak. And you got to question, why is the Justice Department playing a role in obstructing here? And that's a question I have for Sessions as well. She'll be dead, too. So I've taken some strong measures with regard to this judge. Uh, I'm not going to discuss them here uh, because, frankly, we need better judges. But this tells you something about why Sessions needs to step in and man up here because he's not manning up. He's putting his head in the sand. Uh, he's cowering under the pressure. I'm sympathetic to him. I think he's a good guy. But, you know, Jeff, you need to get some cojones right now. And we need to have you sign the petition, everybody, to tell the, the, the attorney general of the United States, you are the attorney general. Do your job, guy. So go to clivenbundydefensefund.org. clivenbundydefensefund.org. And we need to prepare for trial because Cliven's coming up for trial in about a month and a half. And that's why we need your very strong contributions. Again, go to clivenbundydefensefund.org. And I'm just going to say this because we're going to, in our next segment, we're going to talk about O.J. Simpson and a lot of other matters. I have Bob Barr coming on. He was my comrade in arms when we impeached Bill Clinton back in the 1990s. He's the one congressman that I could trust that actually was good to his word. He's now in private practice. He was formerly a U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Bundy, too. But we need to prepare for a defense because if Cliven loses this case, y'all lose. As I say in my southern accent with my days in the south, you all lose because you cannot have the government bust into your house. Say you owe the IRS money. Does that give them the right to bust into your house and beat the crap out of your family and kill your cattle and, t and threaten to kill you? That's what this case is about. And under those circumstances, and Cliven wasn't even armed, but can people come to protest that, that have seen what happened and be armed so they're not beaten up and possibly killed themselves? That's the importance of this case. And here we are in 2017, and we're back in a state that's even worse than we were in 1776. Federal government now is more oppressive than King George III. It's worse. Look at the NSA. We're going to talk about that case later, too. They know everything that we do. We can't move. So I want you to go to Clive and Bundy Defense Fund. I know I'm pumping this. I'm giving you a hard sell, but I can't sell it hard enough. We'll be right back. that make corrupt politicians make wee-wee in their little pants. Transparency and the rule of law will be the touchstones of this president. But we have to pass the bill so that you can uh, find out what is in it. Special Prosecutor Larry Klayman. Be the one who makes our country great again. Go to FreedomWatchUSA.org and donate. I have on the line now a, a very, very good friend of mine. We have a lot of fun together, but we weren't doing fun all the time. Way back when, during the 1990s, it was Bob Barr who was the one who first initiated impeachment against Bill Clinton. He was a congressman from Georgia. I was running Judicial Watch at the time. Bob had formerly been the U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. That's, of course, in the Atlanta area. And we worked together to impeach uh, Bill Clinton. He, Bob worked with Dave Shippers, the impeachment manager. He wanted to broaden the investigation, not just to Lewinsky because that was relatively minor, it certainly was serious lying under oath, but compared to taking money under the table from the Chinese, getting files illegally from the FBI, uh, firing travel gate staff, misusing the IRS. I mean, Clinton and his lovely wife Hillary had committed over 40 scandals by the time we got to impeachment. But of course, even though Bob tried and I tried, and Bob actually submitted Judicial Watch's impeachment report to Congress, it's a matter of the record, uh, we weren't successful because Newt Gingrich, you know, blocked it going further. But, you know, I love Bob. 
Uh, he's a colleague. He's a friend. He's the one congressman I could ever trust on Capitol Hill, and that is true even to this day. He's now in private practice, and I'm inviting him on because I'd like to get his insight into the Bundy case. He's been looking at what's been going on. I want to get his take on it. And then we're going to talk a little about OJ, the famous OJ, and him getting parole yesterday because while Cliven rots in prison for now a year and a half, the judge has denied a speedy trial. She denied him bail. She first threw him into solitary confinement. Uh, she's now pushing back his trial to try other defendants, uh, to try to get convictions that could then come into his case, uh, some of the peaceful protesters. Uh, it's a terrible situation. Cliven is still there, and OJ is out. Okay, so that tells you something about our justice system. Bob, give me your take on, on the Bundy case. You were on previously and talked a little bit about it. We didn't have much time, but we've got a lot more time during this segment. I, I want to get your, your expertise here. Thank you very much, Larry, and uh, your introduction there uh, brought back uh, a lot of very, very good memories of our work together in behalf of uh, justice for the American people and support for the Constitution back during the impeachment uh, proceedings, uh, well, 20 years ago. It's amazing how time flies, but you know, thank goodness you've continued to do your work uh, in various forms uh, consistently in support of uh, true justice, in support of the Constitution, and in support of what's right. And one of the cases that uh, I know you're very familiar with, and I've at, at your request looked into uh, the Clive and Bundy case uh, currently in Nevada, raises a lot of very serious questions. Uh, you touched on, on a couple of them there. But perhaps most immediately is the fact that uh, Clive and Bundy uh, and uh, several of his uh, sons and uh, and other folks remain in jail uh, for really about a, over an, a year and a half right now uh, with no bond, uh, despite the fact that there was uh, no violence, no shots fired uh, during the April 2014 uh, standoff between the citizens and the Bureau of Land Management and other uh, agents from various uh, federal and uh, state and local agencies. Despite that, uh, Clive and Bundy remains uh, in jail uh, with no bond. Uh, the result of both the government and the uh, the court uh, colluding uh, to deny him even that uh, the most fundamental of rights to be free while the charges against him remain pending. So that's an immediate problem. Uh, of course, beyond that, uh, the Bundy case raises a host of issues that are extremely important that every uh, American uh, who believes in property rights, uh, who believes in due process, who believes uh, in the Bill of Rights, both generally and specifically, ought to be paying attention uh, to this case uh, because it uh, represents phenomenal overreaching uh, by the government. Uh, these charges never should have been brought uh, against Bundy and the others, but they were. Uh, they should have been granted bond uh, immediately. Uh, you're right uh, to draw an interesting comparison, Larry, between the Bundy case, where uh, Clive and Bundy remains jailed uh, without bond, uh, and compare that to the uh, O.J. Simpson case, uh, which did involve uh, violence, uh, and pretty much uh, largely because O.J. is such a celebrity. I uh, wouldn't be surprised if he already has uh, a, a lucrative book deal and TV series uh, lined up for when he gets out. He's uh, he's now packing his bags to go home and be a free man uh, once again, uh, while Clive and Bundy, uh, his sons uh, and other family members remain uh, locked up, uh, even though they have been convicted of nothing, much less a violent uh, crime. Uh, and the fact that uh, you, Larry, are working on this on behalf of the American people and the Bundy family uh, is very, very important, and I commend you for that. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, that is certainly is true with regard to the Bundys. And what I've said is that it's not just Clive and it's everybody in this country. If if the federal government under Obama, Loretta Lynch, former attorney general, and Harry Reid, they're going to name an airport after now, if you can believe that, in Las Vegas. You're in Las Vegas on Freedom Fest Festival right now as we speak. You're going to be giving speeches there uh, with a lot of other very famous, important people. Uh, if these people are allowed to prevail... God forbid when the next administration takes hold 
uh, and even this one, you know, who knows what's going to happen, to be able to bust into your house and, and threaten the lives of your family and beat up your sister and tase your sons and harm your dog and kill your cattle, and the federal government then puts you away without bond and puts you in prison in solitary confinement at first. Uh, it's just an outrage. And then, of course, we have O.J., who I'm not going to make too many jokes here, but uh, although I'd like to. Uh, it's a family show. But, I mean, this is a guy who obviously killed Nicole Simpson and Ron Goldman, um, a real low life, who went into a hotel room in Las Vegas, Nevada, a number of years ago, at gunpoint to get his, quote, S.H. back. OK, now maybe it was his, his in part, but he shouldn't be armed. They put him away for probably more years than they should have to pay back for what he had done. They made a legal decision yesterday to let him out. I want to get your take on whether it was the right decision or not. I think under the circumstances, probably it's arguably a correct decision, given the fact that he hasn't been violent you know, for nine years in prison. But it's interesting, before he went to his parole hearing, which was done by video apparently, uh, the guards found him masturbating in his cell. And, you know, that's one thing. I mean, what you do in private, I'm not going to get into that. But do it out in the open. I mean, the guy is sick. And it, it, it's, it, it's questionable whether he should even be out in public, whether he's still a threat. What do you think? I suspect, uh, Larry, that uh, looking at uh, O.J.'s uh, persona, uh, his track record, uh, going back to the days when he was uh, actually married to uh, Nicole Simpson Brown, uh, the numerous uh, times that uh, the local law enforcement was called out to their home because uh, uh, Nicole uh, was complaining that uh, that OJ was uh, beating her up. The man uh, obviously has a very potentially uh, violent disposition. And this was on display, apparently, during the uh, the incident in Nevada that gave rise to his uh, most recent uh, conviction and incarceration. Uh, and even though as a celebrity and a former movie star, he can uh, present himself uh, in the light as a you know, very warm and caring and nonviolent person, the reality is very different. Uh, he, by all accounts, uh, is uh, a violent person uh, and I would think uh, would still pose a danger to the community. But the parole board in Nevada apparently was uh, was more taken in by, I think, his celebrity status uh, and the way that he presented himself to them, which is very different, of course, from uh, what we now know to be the real O.J. Simpson well, that's right. And, you know, I think we haven't heard the last of O.J. Probably there's going to be something that happens in the future. Uh, he was down in Miami, of course, after he won the criminal trial and he had been found guilty of wrongful death with regard to uh, another matter. And, you know, he basically was, I, I think, I kind of remember that he had difficulty with his then girlfriend down there in Miami, uh, may have uh, assaulted her as well. So I think we're going to not hear the last uh, from OJ on that. I also want to get your take, Bob, because you're a privacy advocate. And, you know, during the time of the Clinton years, uh, they tended, attempted to smear you like they've done with President Trump. Uh, they attempted to smear me. I, I have a thicker skin today than I did back then. I guess that's a, a good thing. But, you know, we have our case against the NSA. And, um, Clive and Bundy and his family, they were also illegally surveyed. We know that. Uh, what are your thoughts about the current Trump administration and their uh, position towards illegal surveillance? Of course, President Trump himself has been a victim of that, him and his family. But, you know, you've got a CIA head, Mike Pompeo, who seems to have little problem with massive government surveillance. I wanted to get your take because you're a very strong libertarian and, a, and someone who believes in individual and civil rights. Thank you, Larry. Uh, you're right, I do. I've spent uh, not only the time that I was in the House of Representatives, but the years since then uh, working to, you know, as best I can in my you know small part of the universe. And I know you 
uh, through your work uh, uh, with uh, Freedom Watch and uh, through you know, your radio show and so forth are doing exactly the same thing. And that is, first of all, uh, making the American people aware of and getting them to focus on the tremendous privacy invasive steps uh, and programs in which the federal government has been involved for many years, uh, certainly going back to uh, the Clinton years, uh, going back to Bush one, uh, Bush two, the Obama administration, uh, none of these presidents, none of these administrations apparently saw any problem whatsoever in massive, warrantless, uh, illegal surveillance of American citizens. And they have built uh, a huge technological capability uh, to do just that. Uh, when uh, when President Trump was a was a candidate, uh, even though I think he he does uh, you know, appreciate privacy, certainly he appreciated it. And in, in his business dealings, uh, he seems to have been taken in uh, to some extent by this notion that, well, the only way to guard against uh, you know, terrorist attacks and, and so forth is to engage in massive surveillance. Uh, I'm really hoping that uh, the few voices in the Congress, such as uh, Bob Goodlatz, uh, who chairs the House Judiciary Committee and does seem to understand the need to rein in uh, government uh, surveillance powers uh, through possibly not uh, reauthorizing so-called Section 702 of the USA Patriot Act, uh, there are a few other voices, certainly Rand Paul, uh, Mike Lee in the Senate, uh, who understand these issues. But unfortunately, they appear to still be in a distinct minority. Uh, but we do have the opportunity this year, because uh, Section 702 is up for reauthorization, uh, that is a vehicle that is available, and you and I and other like-minded uh, privacy uh, supportive individuals and institutions need to do everything we can over the next several months to highlight this issue in order to hopefully uh, convince the Trump administration that we can, in fact, uh, adequately protect the American people against acts of terrorism without uh, engaging in warrantless mass surveillance and databasing of information on Americans' uh, electronic communications generally. Uh, that seems to be the direction in which our uh, government still is going. Uh, we have an opportunity, small as it may be, this year to change that in some small way and bring a little bit more constitutionality to the effort. And uh, I commend you for continuing that battle. This is the time to do it. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, we're a little bit out of time, but I'm going to bring you back later because Bob's a great intellect and he's a warrior who doesn't shirk from responsibility. Like I said, the one congressman who, frankly, ever stood there and didn't Cower. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Larry. We'll be right back. Before he was a trial lawyer, he sliced him and diced him. People used to ask me, Larry, what caused you to start Judicial Watch and now Freedom Watch, given the powerful forces in this country that put you at risk? In a meat packing plant. I'm the son of meat packers in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know how to slice and dice. A very special prosecutor, Larry Clayman. If you'd like to support Freedom Watch and this radio show, go to freedomwatchusa.org. I want to wrap up this show. This is the verdict section by... Elaborating what Bob Barr just talked about and what I talked about, privacy rights in this country. And you know that we represent this whistleblower, Dennis Montgomery. We brought him forward to James Comey of the FBI. Uh, he turned over 47 hard drives, 600 million pages of information, much of which was classified. I've never seen it. And Comey was supposed to be doing an investigation. And then, of course, we find out along the way that Comey was engaged in illegal surveillance of nearly everybody. Uh, and the FBI was doing this criminally. So it's no surprise that he buried this investigation. And we at Freedom Watch has brought, have brought a lawsuit. You can go to freedomwatchusa.org, O-R-G, freedomwatchusa.org. Please contribute to our cause. Uh, we're small, but we're powerful. And we previously enjoined President Obama, the National Security Agency, 
and others for illegal surveillance back in 2013, 2014, but they kept it up. And as Bob pointed out, they continue to violate, in particular, Section 702 of the Patriot Act, which allows the government to surveil everybody who makes calls overseas. Now, of course, we know with Trump that not only did they surveil calls that he and his team were making in the days leading up to the uh, election of November 8, 2016, when he was elected, but then they illegally released that information into the public domain. And that was a crime. So this is an extremely important case. Go to freedomwatchusa.org and see what we're doing, because we've asked for early discovery. You know, Washington, things have changed over the years since the days I started Judicial Watch and now for, that I have Freedom Watch. These judges are much more timid. They don't get involved. They're more politicized. I don't believe that Leon is. He's one of the few that is not. He generally does what's right when he moves cases along, and he is moving this case along, which is good. But the American people need to rise up because we've got a big problem here is the judiciary. You know, there are 147 vacancies that President Trump needs to fill. I would say about 70, 80, in some respects, well over 90 percent, as in the federal court in D.C., are now Clinton and Obama appointees. They are highly political. They don't rule on the basis of the law generally. They rule on the basis of their political beliefs. We recently saw that with regard to the judge in Hawaii and the immigration temporary travel moratorium that the Supreme Court said was fine, that President Trump had put into effect after the Ninth Circuit, Fourth Circuit, and other courts have ruled it to be illegal. And the judge in Hawaii, a buddy of Obama who went to law school with him, uh, then modified what the Supreme Court said. So Trump had to go back to the Supreme Court. But what's important here is that we've got a good judge. And Leon pointed out that the national intelligence agencies and Obama and others and Comey, they couldn't cite one example when this mass surveillance actually caught a terrorist. So we need your strong support in this case. And nobody else has the courage to do this because, frankly, they're worried that if they press too hard against the FBI and the intelligence agencies, that these government entities will try to destroy them. And, of course, that takes us back to Clive and Bundy. He also was illegally surveilled. See what we do in that regard in the near term. Because we cannot have this Orwellian police state. We cannot have the government standing over us, knowing every movement, everything we say, everything we email, everything we text, because this gives them total control. And that's what the left wants. They want total control. They want to rule our lives. They want to enslave us. And that's what Cliven was saying, you know, after he gave his, his infamous press conference where he used the word Negro, which he didn't mean any harm by it. He's not a racist. In fact, the African-Americans in prison, prison love him. So that's what we're doing at Freedom Watch. It's groundbreaking. This show talks about the stuff that we're doing each week. Like I said, we don't just regurgitate the news. We make the news. And that's why we need your very strong support, because we can't do it without you. We rely on contributions. We rely upon your prayers. So please go to freedomwatchusa.org. I can't say it enough. Freedomwatchusa.org. Sign up for our free publications, our YouTubes. Please contribute to our cause. We are your Justice Department. Without us, there is no justice. And we're fighting for you every day, not just in the courts, but in the courts of public opinion, in the media, elsewhere. Uh, we need to do all we can to try to restore this country to the vision of our founding fathers. Because if we don't, we will not have a country much longer. And you can see, as Clive and Bundy rots in jail, we have a murderer that's out on the loose. We need your support. God bless you. God bless America. And God save America. We'll see you next week.